to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. Today I'm going to talk about the ascension and the post-resurrection bodies. So for those that like preaching, you'll get a little bit of that. Those that like teaching, you'll get some of that as well. Uh, this may be a little cerebral for you. You can think, think on these things and think deeper. For those that are thinkers, I gave you a lot of stuff in Sunday school, a ton of stuff. We talked about the deep and we talked about people being compared to pigs. And I know it's like people like call people. We're not calling people pigs, but I was talking about the comparison of the pig body to the human body and how close it is. And I gave a lot of scripture on it and gave also uh, some scientific facts and medical facts in regard to that. So if you like that kind of stuff, go back and listen to the Sunday school. It was recorded. It should be on the website. All right. So let's go to first Corinthians chapter 15 and let's look in verse number one. When we say we preach the gospel, this is what we preach, and this is what has the power. Again, when you're witnessing to somebody, you can give them opinions, and you can give them some of your own testimonies, but in the end, give them scripture. Give them scripture and tell them why they can have a change of life and how they can have a change of life. It's the gospel, the gospel and the power of the gospel that changes lives. It's not the power of your opinions. It's not the power of news media. It's not the power of any books or novels or magazines. It's the power of the gospel that changes lives and the power that Christ gave us through the gospel. So what is it? In a nutshell, the gospel is five different points. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again, according to the scriptures. He got, according to the scriptures, two times in those five points. That's how important the Bible is to eternal life. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. The word of God. And I told somebody one time, we're saved by the scripture. And they said, no, we're saved by the blood of Christ. I said, yes, but we're saved by the scripture. And they just really had a hard time with that one. And they said, you got to come over and explain that, because I don't know if I agree with that. And I went over to the house, and I sat down, and we went over it. They said, the Bible says we're saved by the blood. Well, it says we're redeemed by the blood. It says we're washed by the blood. We're forgiven by the blood. And in reality, we're saved by the blood. But how would we know about the blood if it wasn't for the word of God? So the word of God is the seed. All this works together. Doesn't it the spirit that has a hand in salvation as well? And the spirit moves what? Through the word to convict men, to convince men, to reveal to man his ungodly state so that a man can say, I see it now. It's the word of God that opens the eyes, isn't it? And it's through the preaching of the cross. And to the world, it's foolishness. But to us which are saved, it's the power of God. The power of God. It's in the gospel. So important, the gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. And how important is preaching? Preach the word. Amen? Preach the word. The instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Preach the word. When the word is preached, faith comes. Okay? the preaching, and preaching manifests, manifests salvation and the Lord. It makes it clear. The preaching does that. Manifest the word, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And that's something that's very important there. People say, see, you can lose your salvation. No, it's not saying that. It's saying unless you believed in vain, a false profession. And how many people have you witnessed to where they try to get you off their back by just saying, okay, I'll pray. Is that really conviction? Is that really sincerity? Is that really a contrite heart that's praying just to get you off of their back? You know, as a Christian, we need to, we need to be careful. We don't force somebody into just praying to pray because that would be believing in vain. 
And that person will wind up in hell thinking they prayed a prayer they didn't even mean. And you got to think about that. And that's the challenge that Paul put on all of us, everyone. That's why he says many times, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Know ye not whether ye be in the faith, except ye be reprobate. Everybody in here can take a look inside. That's what Paul was saying. Examine yourself. Look in there. Is Christ in there? Now, I have no reason to believe anybody here, and I don't know about Zoom, but anybody within this congregation, I have no reason to believe you might not be saved. But you got to go back to the day that you were saved. You got to think, did I understand it? Was there conviction? And did I mean that prayer? Now, there's no harm in admitting that potentially maybe you didn't get it. Wouldn't you rather pray and ask the Lord to save you and make sure, knowing of surety that I am saved? Uh, and I'm not going to park on that here. I'm just throwing that out because the Holy Spirit kind of gave me the impression of make sure you say that. And for everybody listening, it's so, so important because what's the most important thing you have? Your house, your car, your girlfriend, your boyfriend. What's the most important thing you have? Your soul. Verse, what proves that? Two, Mark and Matthew. You always quote Mark, or you always quote Matthew, and I always quote Mark. For what shall it profit a man? He shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? No matter rich, poor, Woman, man, elder, youngster, the most important thing you have is your soul. And you better make sure that your soul, if your body would happen to die, you better make sure your soul is prepared to meet God. As they say about American Express, don't leave home without it. I say this, Jesus Christ, don't leave earth without him. Don't leave earth without him. Make sure he's in there. Make sure he's in there. Okay. Let's go to verse number three. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So, so Paul said, I received this. I've done this. How that Christ died for our sin, according to the scripture. So, so important, isn't it? Christ died. He began the points of the, of the gospel by dying, according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, not only did he do that, and we preached on that, the resurrection, and we talked about that 40 days ago, because we're, we're at Ascension, which would have been Thursday, the 18th, so that's 40 days from the resurrection, the Ascension occurred, so I figured today would be a good day to talk about that. We've already talked about the resurrection, but what about after he came back from the dead? Were there witnesses? And the reason I went here was because I want to show you that he was not just seen of the 12, as it says in verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12. And that, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren. That's a lot of witnesses. At once. Now, if 500 people said they saw something, would it stand in court? Would any judge say you people were crazy? You couldn't have seen that. When 500 people said, we saw that, that judge would have to agree. He was seen by over 500 people at one time. But yet there are people today that deny the resurrection of Christ. He was seen after he was dead by 500 people at one time. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles. And right there is Paul telling you what the criteria of the apostle is. And that tells you today there are no apostles. No apostles today. So when somebody says they have the gift of the apostles today, they don't because there are no apostles today. 
an apostle had to be associated with Christ's ministry on earth and had to have witnessed him and seen him. That's why Paul said, I was as the one born out of due time. I am the least of the apostles. He was not there to see Christ physically. That's why the criteria for an apostle would not have applied to him, except that Christ appeared to him to show him who he was. That's why Paul is called an apostle. And the signs of the apostles and the gifts of the apostles were given to them. And after Paul died out and all those apostles, so did the gifts. So when somebody says today, I'm an apostle, or I have the gifts of the apostle, or they believe in apostolic succession, the Bible says they're a liar. In the book of Revelation, it tells it calls them liars. So what are we? We're not apostles. What are we? We're disciples. We're disciples of Christ. Okay, we're followers of the Lord. All right, so uh, here we have Christ being seen after he was resurrected from the dead. All right, let's go ahead and go over to, um, let's go to uh, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts 1. Acts chapter 1. And we'll look in verse number 1. Acts 1.1. 1, 1. This is where you'll find the ascension. And what a great thing this was. But yeah, what a sorrowful thing at the same time. You know, death death is never easy to accept in the departure of someone. You say, well, Christ died and he came back. Yeah, but he still left. So this technically would be like him going away from them. So they would see him no more. And you'd be sorrowful because they loved him. Um, so it says here, this is the ascension, Acts 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. So the passion of Christ, the passion of the Christ is the death and uh, burial, resurrection, after his passion, the death, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which we'll talk about next week. That promise of the Father is the Holy Ghost, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And praise God. All of us in here have been baptized by the Holy Ghost. And you didn't get that as a second work of grace. You didn't pray one day and get saved. And then all of a sudden, a couple months later, the Holy Spirit came on you and you spoke in tongues and you got this second work of grace. Is that what happened? You got everything you needed when you said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my savior. And it's at that moment, the Lord saved you and he baptized you with the Holy Ghost. You got all you needed right there. You were saved. No second work of grace is needed. That was it right there, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Okay, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They were looking for that restoration. And that, that's good there, because what should we be waiting for? The Bible says, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know he went out. And the angels that are there testify and say, as we'll read, the way he went out is the way he's coming back. Okay, so let's look in verse number seven. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, 
ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And all of us should say, Amen. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Okay, so he left and he took off. But he said, and they said, he said, I'll be back. And they said, the same Jesus who went up in like manner, he's going to come and wait for him. But before he comes, that Holy Spirit's going to be sent to you, the promise of the Father, that comforter, to come to you. Okay, now, that's the ascension. But in those 40 days, he had a body. And all of you deep students of the Bible, let's examine that body. What did that body have? What do we have? We have a body, soul, spirit, don't we? Do we have bones? Do we have flesh? Do we have blood? What keeps us alive? The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. The blood is what keeps us alive. But yet, when you go see a dead body at a funeral home, that body has no color to it. What did they take out of the body? They took the blood out. What did they put in? They put in embalming fluid. They put in a preserving fluid. So they wanted to preserve that body. Okay, now, the scripture tells us if the life of the flesh is in the blood, but when the body dies, if the blood's still in the body, what rapidly occurred? Corruption. Corruption occurred. Okay? Christ did not fall on corruption. So something happened. When he was on the cross, when they pierced his heart, Forthwith came blood and water. It appears that our Lord dripped every drop of blood he had and was totally bled out. And his blood went down into the earth. The Lord knows where that blood is. And I'll tell you right now, spiritually, that blood fills every one of us. That blood spirals throughout every Christian. And that blood is connecting us. And that's when we come together in that communion. We break the bread, don't we? From one piece. And we take each of those pieces. And we give the pieces out. And when we eat it, what happens? The Lord sees it and says, it's now back, back together. Because we're all one body, aren't we? In the Lord. And when we eat that bread, we celebrate the one body we have in Christ. And when we have that communion with him, we're joined with him. Now, we don't believe it to be literal where we're taking the actual body and blood of Christ. We believe it to be symbolic. But what it symbolizes is the breaking of the body of Christ. We take it and we come back together as one piece, one body with the Lord. How important that is. But when he came back from the dead, what wasn't in him? He lacked something. He lacked blood. He lacked blood. He had a body that was different than theirs. A body that could come and go at will. But a body that still could be touched. A body that desired to eat, but a body that didn't have to. What an amazing thing, folks. One of these days, we're going to go from the cocoon we're in. We're going to go from the caterpillar state to the butterfly state. Okay, let's go to, let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Now, before we do that, before we do that, let's go to Genesis. Okay, I have to go. I want to show you something I saw in regard to genealogies and families. Genesis. Dave would tell me, all roads lead back to Genesis with you, Pastor. And if you say any of the books are your favorite, you're wrong, because Genesis is your favorite book. And 
Dr. Spratley would argue with me all day about that. And I got to admit, I'm pretty fond of Genesis. Genesis chapter two. And the more I know, the more I become more fonder with it. It says in Genesis chapter two and verse 23, look what Adam says of his wife. And the big question, the big question is, where's the blood? Where's the blood? He had bones because it cost him a rib, didn't it? And haven't women been in the pain, pain in your side ever since, men? No, I'm just joking. We're probably more a pain in their side. I'd give you the joke about, you know, God was going to take a leg from Adam, you know, and make Eve. And said, it's going to cost you a leg. I'll give you the perfect woman. She'll do everything for you. She'll cook for you, clean for you, never sass back, never do everything you want her to do. Massage your feet before you go to bed. Do it all. But it's going to cost you a leg. And Adam turned around to God and said, what can I get for a rib? You know, so you're supposed to laugh. I thought that was funny. I, ah, come on. I thought that was a good one. I really did. <laughs> Yeah, say, Pastor, don't quit your day job. All right, anyway. All right, let's go. It says in verse 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. I had a friend who was an anesthetist, and he said, see, there you go. My occupation's right there. It's one of the first. You can't say that, but I can. And he was so proud of his, his occupation because God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he said, that's what I do with all my patients. So, <laughs> I was like, not life, you know, really? Okay. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And I've been asked the age old question because I'm in radiology. Does a man have less ribs than a woman? The answer to that is an emphatic no. We have 12 sets of ribs, 12 sets of ribs, male, female. Adam had one less. He lost the rib. Okay. So God performed surgery. In verse two, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. So he used it like a tool to fashion her, a sculpture, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And here, here you find God knows what man likes. So if you're looking for a wife, what should you do? Come on, if you're looking for a wife, what should you do? Ask the Lord, didn't he fashion her? Say, Adam's going to love you. Adam's going to love you. And he brought her to the man. Wasn't it God who brought her to the man? So, man, if you're looking for a wife, what should you do? Go to God. I need a wife. You pick her. You pick her. And you said, just like you brought her to Adam, bring her to me. That's a wise prayer. Any of you married men ever pray that? You say, oh, I wish I would have. <laughs> God knows, you single men, I'm telling you. God knows. You go to God. All right. And Adam was very pleased. He was very pleased with what the Lord had brought him. Made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and blood of my blood and flesh of my flesh. No. Say, Pastor, don't add that in. That's not there. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Why didn't he say blood? Why? They probably didn't have it. They probably didn't have it. Had they fallen yet, would they have died? They couldn't. So if the life of the flesh is in the blood, that means something happened to the fluid from Adam and Eve when they ate the fruit. And when you think about the fruit, everyone says, well, it's an apple. How many have heard that? Anybody ever hear other fruits? Pomegranate, grape. What fruit in the Bible is like in the blood? The grape. So did they eat of the vine tree? which over the course of time has caused so many sins, hasn't it? Has been the lead role in so many accidents 
and so many suicides and so many liver diseases and so many other things that alcohol has caused through that grape. Wasn't it Noah who sinned right after he got off the ark? What did he sin by? He sinned by alcohol. Wasn't it David who tried to get Uriah drunk so he could cover his sin? Wasn't it through alcohol, through the grape? The grape, something connected. And when you think about this, what did Jesus do? What was his first miracle? He changed water into wine. So what was in their body? Was it water? Was it some type of an fluid that lubricated them? And then when they fell, God said, now you're going to die. And they knew they had a physical change immediately. And they covered themselves. And I'm sure they looked at each other and said, oh, you don't look real good. You don't look good either. We look a lot different than we did before. And they knew it, didn't they? They knew it. They hid. They hid. Okay. There's something to it all. The resur post-resurrection body goes back to what Adam and Eve were. And praise the Lord, we're going to be that way. This corruptible shall put what? On incorruption. And this mortal shall put on immortality. The flesh profiteth nothing. It is the spirit that profiteth. And if we go to the book of Corinthians, which we will, we're going to see this statement by God. And one of the only times in the Bible, if not the only time, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Every other time, it's flesh and bone. But that time, it's flesh and blood. And watch this. When the families and genealogies are reckoned together, they do not hint to the blood. Like when people say, well, you're of my blood, common blood. Well, that's the way we see it. But in the Bible, God saw it differently and wrote down, you're of my flesh and of my bone. Something permanent about flesh. There's something permanent about blood, but it's not permanent, or I'm sorry, flesh and bone. There's not permanent, anything permanent about flesh and blood. The permanency is flesh and bone. And in fact, those bones are something to the holiness of a person's bones. So much so that Joseph said, when you leave Egypt, carry what with you? I'm going to die here in Egypt. Don't leave me here. He was dead. Why would he care? He said, but when you go out, you take my bones with me. And wasn't it somebody who fell on somebody's bones and got reju rejuvenated? A dead man was put and they touched the bones of the prophet. All of a sudden, life came back into him. And let gentlemen, a bad wife, marry a woman who's not good for you and treats you ill and doesn't respect you. What's the Bible say she does to you? She's as rottenness to the bones. She's like a bad case of arthritis. That'd make a good country song, wouldn't it? All right, let's go to let's go to Genesis 29. Look, Genesis 29. Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29 and verse 14. But a godly woman, let's give some women some praise here before our women walk out and say that pastor, that's all he does. Let's give you women some praise. A godly woman, a virtuous woman, is a crown to her husband. So, men, when you're walking around and you got a crown on your head, it's because you got a godly wife. She can really, when you think about it, a woman can make or break a man. And that's what God's saying. Marry one that doesn't isn't good for you, and you're going to have a case of arthritis your whole life. It's going to be like rottenness in your bones. Marry one that's good for you. And she'll be like a crown to you. And as one whispered, I heard a tree of life. Keep you living. And in fact, happy married men live longest. They don't live longer than the women. But as far as men go, happily married men live the longest. Okay. There you go, ladies. Now walk out and say, that's better. Genesis 29. Genesis 29 and verse 14. Look what Laban says of Jacob. 
And Laban said to him, surely thou art my bone and my flesh. He didn't say blood, did he? He said, we're not connected by blood. You're my bone and my flesh. Let's go to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 19. 2 Samuel 19. Second Samuel 19. Look in verse 12, 11 and 12, or 12. King David, okay? But we'll look at 11. And King David sent to Zadok and to Abiathar the priest, saying, Speak unto the elders of Judah, saying, Why are ye the last to bring the king back to his house? Seeing the speech of all Israel was come to the king, even to his house. Ye are my brethren. Ye are my bones and my flesh. Where's the blood? It's absent. Ye are my bones and my flesh. So even there, genealogies and family reckoned by this. When the devil wanted to touch Job, could he have given him any kind of illness? But what did he choose to do? He touched his flesh and he touched his bone. He touched his flesh and his bone. Job chapter 2. The Lord gives him leave that you can go to even the sacred thing here. You can touch him all the way to his flesh and his bone, all the way to the bone, as sacred as those bones are to God. He doesn't even say blood. He just bypasses that. In verse 4, and Satan answered the Lord and said, in chapter 2, verse 4, and Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh even the devil recognized bone and flesh no blood touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse thee to thy face and the lord said unto satan behold he is in thine hand but save his life when all the way down to that very bone and the flesh okay let's go over to luke chapter 24 luke chapter 24 this gets even better. Luke chapter 24. There's something about the resurrected body and the bone and the flesh of the glorified Savior that was able to transport itself as a beam me up Scotty type thing. If you're a star, if you're a Trekkie in here, say beam me up Scotty, that means that your molecules, who's a Trekkie? Anybody a Trekkie? I'm not. I just know that. Who's a Trekkie? Anybody Trekkie? So I say beam me up Scotty and you would go, what? The, you know, yeah, right. Is that what that is? I don't know, but you know, Spock and all that stuff and beam me up, Scotty, and your molecules would change, and then all of a sudden you'd appear over here and you'd be able to transport. You say, where did they come up with that idea? Well, Jesus in his resurrected body was able to Donnie run real fast into the door. <laughs> Run real fast and see if you can go through that door. Yeah, Donnie's like, no, come on. He because any anybody want to try? Phil, from the back, run real fast into that door and see if you run through that door. Just for an example of what not to do. But if Jesus, in his glorified form after he was post resurrection, could he have? And did he? So what's going on? Listen, when you get sad and you think, I'm dying. Or you go to the doctor and they give you bad news. And I know it would be real shocking. I know it would. I've seen it all the time. I see it almost every day where people get bad news. People don't take it easy. And they've even done studies to talk about the death process. Acceptance. You know, at first it's denial. And you're going to beat it. Then you get to a point in life that you know, I can't beat this. And then acceptance comes. And people have done studies on all this. I mean, you know, we're privy to all of that information in the, in the field I work in. Like we see it all the time. And you can see it happening in people. At the beginning, they're strong. And then they get to the point and they understand it's coming. And there's, the inevitable is going to happen. 
But when you get to that point, you got to understand this last step at the threshold of death and stepping over is such a metamorphosis. And it might not happen right away because you're not going to have your flesh, but the Lord says it will. The Lord says that all that are in the grave are going to hear his voice. And those that are dead and are saved, they're coming back. And when they come back, they're going to have flesh and they're going to have bone. And it's going to be just like his body. And it's going to be able to walk right through a wall. He gave us the example. And in that, we ought to say, amen. Amen. I was thinking about this the other day. You know, I have an artificial hip. They took the old one out. I wanted that so bad. I still do this day. I said, I should have asked for that hip. I wanted to see what it looked like. I wanted to see what I walked on my whole life. And I'm so upset I didn't. But one day God will show me the hip. But the metal prosthetic I have, it's going away. God's doing surgery beyond what they can do. He's given me my old one back in a new, with a new head on it. And everything you have, God's going to glorify it. And you're going to get it all back. And amputees that have lost their legs or lost an arm or somebody lost another body part, God is going to take that thing and put it right back on you. And you're going to have it glorified. Amen and amen. Because as he is, so will we be. For we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him. I quote it backwards. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Let's go to uh, Luke 24. Luke 24, and let's look over here in verse 36. What is it going to be like? Am I going to like food? Who's looking forward to the day when you don't have to worry about blood pressure and diabetes and say, I can eat to my fill and I can have all the crab legs I want. Amen, Ben. I know you love crab. Ben loves crab legs. And it's Tommy loves steak. I know. And pizza. Tommy is the pizza eater. He loves pizza. And other people in here, I don't know what everybody likes, but I know you like food. And George loves barbecue. He is the barbecue pit master Can barbecue anything. Say so loves barbecue and others love certain things. And you say, Am I gonna like those things? Am I gonna be able to am I gonna be able to fish over there? Oh, I love fishing. Am I gonna be able to sit down at a chessboard and play somebody? Well, it's gonna be tough when you both have the mind of Christ. Somebody's gotta win and lose. <laughs> you know, you go out to I'm at my 1500 combination and I think I'll move the pawn instead. You know, and the person says, Oh, that was interesting. You should have thought about 1501 because this was a better move, you know, and they can go out that far and you think, how can the mind think like that? No holes barred. Is there when you get your resurrection body, you're going to be just like Jesus Christ. And what was he like? Luke chapter 24, Luke 24 and verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. He just came from nowhere and said unto them, peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. If he did that right here, what would we do? Oh, wouldn't we? It's me. It's me. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? Well, I, obviously because you weren't here a second ago. Why are you troubled and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones. See, no blood. Flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, have ye here any meat? He couldn't get him to believe. He said, okay, let's try this. You got any food? I said, yeah, yeah, here. And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and a honeycomb, and he did eat it. 
And he took it and did eat it before them. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Okay, now, he could travel between the invisible and the visible worlds instantaneously. Now, this gets even better. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and look in verse number 30. Our relationship with Christ is like a man's relationship with his wife. It says, for we are members of his body, in verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. We are one flesh. We are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. Okay? So, again, the eternity the eternal ID here of flesh and bone and us being one with Christ. Now, as I said, he could eat, but it wasn't necessary. Our bodies begin to decay, and even they are now. And we know this because how many in here are hungry? Come on, how many are hungry? Come on, you hungry? How many are thirsty? Say, I could really go for a glass of water. I really could use a glass of water. And you're thirsty. You know what that's your body's telling you? I need food because I'm starting to corrupt. I need water because I'm starting to corrupt. If you don't give me these things, I'm going to die. I have to have it. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, they shall thirst no more, neither hunger anymore. Our bodies will not thirst. Once we get our glorified body, it will never thirst and it will never hunger. So you can eat for pleasure, but you don't have to if you don't want. So for those in the world today that don't like to eat, you say, I don't want to eat. It's a bother to me. I don't ever want to eat again. You won't have to. Your body will be able to sustain itself with what God made it to do. This is how Adam and Eve would have lived forever. And then many, many questions. Well, if let's say I fell from the Empire State Building, this is what I think. Adam and Eve are up there or on vacation and they're in a glorified body and Eve slips and she falls off the Empire State Building and she was glorified, right? Never sinned. Would she have died? She couldn't die which means she wouldn't have bruised, which means her bones wouldn't have broken. And if they did at all, she wouldn't have felt pain because they didn't have pain and things would have healed themselves up. These things are things that drive me to think, how can I have flesh and how can I have bone? Because bone is rigid. How can I not break those? But those are mysterious to me and someday, someday God will answer those questions but I know this, I will never thirst. I will never hunger. There shall be no more tears. There shall be no more pain. There shall be no more sickness. For the former things are passed away. So when you get down about this earth, and you get down about your life here, think about this. There's a new one coming. And as Jesus went out, he's coming back. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And here's my closing verse. Wherefore, comfort. Comfort one another with these words. Be comfortable and know, no matter what happens here, you've got a better life waiting for you. Right.